I think you'll agree when we go through this, it's basically one-on-one, -on -one, one -on one-on-one contact that is available to every believer, but I don't think all of us really pay attention to this. And the way things are spiritually uh, in the present day, this kind of ministry is going to be needed more and more. Um, I'm thinking, actually, that's why I'm kind of taking the mickey from the enemy about this book I'm writing about the Lord's Supper. It's nearly done. I think it's going to help a lot of people, and I don't think Satan's real happy about that. So he's trying to put pressure on from different directions. I got permission from two people uh, to add their material to the book as appendices. So there's going to be a lot of stuff in this book, not just about the Lord's Supper, but about churches and what qualifies a minister, how to know the right from the wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And I just think it's going to be a real help. It might be close to 200 pages. When I first started, I thought, boy, I hope I crack 100 at least. So it's not a pamphlet or a booklet, but it looks like it might be with the appendices, maybe, maybe close to 200. Poor Solomon, he has to format that baby. <laughs> James chapter 5, we're going to just look at the last two verses. And again, we're thinking about an unusual ministry. This is kind of one-on-one. -on -one. This is the very close of this first letter, his only letter, uh, to the church at large, not a particular congregation. This is uh, James, the uh, half-brother of our Lord. You may remember Jesus, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, paid James a personal visit, and that's probably when he ordained him to the ministry, and he was the bishop, the pastor, the elder, whatever word you want to use, of the large congregation in Jerusalem. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, an unusual ministry. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The question that we're trying to answer from James's letter tonight is what should we do about make-believers in the local church? I think most of us have walked with God long enough, been members of enough different churches to have figured out that not all that glitters in a local assembly is gold. There are a lot of people that profess faith in Christ but don't possess it. There are a lot of people that honor God with their lips but they don't with their lives. What should we do? What causes it? And what should we do about this? How can we change things? I'm, I'm going to look at these two verses in two sections. The first thing we're going to think about is the wrong turn some people make. The wrong turn. And then the second thing we're going to look at is the concept of U-turns. And that's going to be in two pieces. The first is the U-turn, 180. The second is the Y-O-U turn meaning you and I can get involved in making this reversal possible. Let's look at the wrong turn first. Who is James talking to? Very important. He is not trying to get unsaved people into the kingdom of God. He's writing to believers, primarily Jewish believers. But as you probably realize if you attend this church any length of time, uh, pretty much, even though Jewish, very Hellenized, Greekified, if you will, you recall they, are, they were reading a Greek Old Testament. James is writing to them in Greek, even though he was Jewish. And, uh, and so we thank God for that because it's the most precise language God ever gave us. And uh, a Greek scholar, A.T. Robertson, says English is second. And I, I think he's probably right. English is a beautiful language, and it also is very, very good in terms of clarity. So James is an apostle uh, in addition to being a bishop, pastor, elder. How many know that we've talked about these things? Yeah. He's an apostle, but we don't know much about him traveling. A lot, usually when we think of apostles, we call them usually missionaries today. We think about somebody going out, you know, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means being sent to do a certain thing at a certain time, at a certain place, for a certain people, with a certain result. It normally involves people coming into the kingdom, and it definitely involves uh, a continual or habitual confirmation from the Lord through signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, anybody, he, she, it, whatever, that claims that office of apostle and does not have uh, people getting saved, does not have signs, wonders, and miracles following is mistaken about their calling. 
Um, as I mentioned, he was the half-brother of Jesus, personally ordained by him to lead the church. And according to Paul in Galatians 1 and uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he was one of three pillars in the early church. Uh, Paul talks about uh, James, Peter, and John. And he lists James first, by the way, in Galatians chapter 1. So he was a pillar in the local church. And as I mentioned, he was not writing to one local congregation, but to the church at large. So you can probably assume that that letter that he wrote went around the actual autograph. Can you imagine having his actual letter? Or they made copies, perhaps, and sent them around to the various local congregations. So he's writing to the church at large, again, not to get unbelievers to become believers, but he's writing to church people to believers. And here it is. Here's the wrong turn. Brothers, one text says, my brothers, same idea. If anyone among you has been led astray from the truth. Let's stop right there. Sad, isn't it? That someone attending, and we're assuming this is a Bible-believing, God-honoring, Jesus-worshiping, spirit-filled congregation like the early church. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Or sad to think someone in that case would not have the truth in their heart. Or if they did, that they would step aside from it. But that's the picture here. Brothers, if anyone among you has been led astray from the truth. The word led astray there is wander. Uh, it, it means to, it was originally used of someone giving somebody directions incorrectly, deliberately. I got directions from Ron today to go to Charlie's house. The kind of the back way. And they were great directions. I was there in five minutes. And then Charlie told me the quickest way to get where I wanted to go from there. And they were great directions. How many of you know you don't always get that? I feel real embarrassed to say this. I, I really do. I was pastoring another church, and we had Sunday night services. And a lot of times after service, a bunch of us would get together and go to a restaurant. So I had an associate, and then we had a youth minister. And it was terrible, but God's a forgiving God. We'd be fixing to go someplace, and the youth minister would say, hey, where, where are we going tonight? You know, And so my associate would look at me, straight face. I knew what was coming. He'd say, oh, we're going to go over to Jerry's. Okay, we'll see you over in about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, right. And then we'd go to Frisch's. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was terrible. One night he shows up 20 minutes late. You know, He said, you guys, you did it again. He said, I knew you were going to do this. Uh, what did we do? We led him astray right? We told him here, and we were actually going there. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. This, word, this word, planao, actually was used of, of leading a sheep astray. And then later on, it came to, to be used, you know, symbolically, metaphorically. You lead someone on the wrong path in terms of their lifestyle or, or their belief system. Um, you lead them into a moral wrong direction. Actually, we get the word planet from this word. Um, and, and this is what's happened to the person. Something else I want to mention about this, which again is kind of sad. Um, the, the grammar that James uses here is, is, you could phrase it like this. Brothers, if anyone among you has been led astray from the truth, and it's likely that it's happened. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, don't be surprised. It's likely that, that this is the case. Very sad, isn't it? Um, but then again, when you think about Christ's words along this line, he talked about wheat and tares, sheep and goats, wise servants, I should say virgins and unwise, profitable, unprofitable servants. He talked about the kingdom of God being like a net, brought the fish up on the shore and separated the good fish from the bad. And he talked about sowing into the world good seed and bad. And so in a sense, it's, it's the same concept here. You know, we're not talking about Christians and Buddhists or Christians and Hindus or, you know, Christians and Muslims, etc. We're talking about Christians and then within the Christian church, those who say they're one thing and actually are not. And this is very sad. And I want you to notice um, in my little paraphrase, if anyone among you, and it's likely that, that they have been, have been led, led astray from the truth, you know, that's passive. How many see that? It doesn't say if anyone left the truth although that's what happened. But you get the, get the picture here. Somebody's whispering in their ear or inviting them. Hey, come over here. You ought to hear this lady. 
She's a prophetess, you know. You ought to hear this guy. He's got a mailing list longer than your arm, you know. And yet they may not be the real deal. But the person, the church member, listens and is led astray. Um, what, what I'm saying here is, according to James, somebody played a part. Now you think about it. How did you come to Christ? Somebody played a part. Whether it was one-on-one -on -one, or you went to an evangelistic meeting, it was one on many, whether a person used the hook or the net, God used people, right? Remember when, when uh, Philip asked the Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? He had the, the, the scroll of Isaiah open on his lap. He was reading it. He was also saying it. So he was hearing himself say it, Isaiah 53. So he had the word. He read the word. He was saying the word. He was listening to the word, but he wasn't saved yet. And Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? In other words, do you have faith? What did the Ethiopian eunuch say? How can I accept someone guide me? You know, that same word is used of the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth. Isn't that amazing? We can be like the Holy Spirit in that sense of, of leading someone either to the Lord or away from him. Humans are meant to be servants, either of the true spirit or the false one. And I want to say something else before we move on to the U-turn part. This person, according to James, is among them. Everybody say among. Important. The word there is en, en, in the midst of you. If anyone in the midst of your gathering has been led astray from the truth, and it's likely that this has happened. He doesn't say anyone of you, ek. In other words, a real bona fide believer. He's talking about someone in the midst. Some, a hanger on or someone that claps their hands or sings the songs or, or maybe even has a place of, of service formally in the church. But the idea is this person is among N, but not of ek, that local congregation. Reminds me of the person in 1 Corinthians 5 that Paul talked about who was living in sin with his stepmother. Have you ever read that carefully, 1 Corinthians 5? It, it really bears some study, and I, I mentioned, I referenced it in the book I'm working on. Uh, it's very important stuff. Paul calls that guy in the Corinthian church, leaven, leaven, which is negative, right? And he calls the church unleavened. Does that sound like the same? Is unleavened bread the same as leavened bread? No. So the church, the true body of Christ in Corinth, is unleavened, spiritually right with God. But this one member, according to Paul, is not unleavened like them. He is leavened. He also calls him, at the end of chapter 5, a wicked person. God never uses the term leaven of true believers, never calls a believer wicked, never calls a believer a sinner. All those words are only for unbelievers. What does God call us? Thanks, Gene. Saints. Saints. Well, wait a minute. I thought that, that church I read about said you gotta, you got to die first, and then you got to be nominated, and then you got to have one or two miracles from people praying to you. You know, well... I guess the Lord didn't get that memo because anybody that made Jesus Lord in the New Testament is referred to as saints. We're all saints. We're not called sinners. We're not called leaven. We're not called wicked. Tracking with me? I'm not sure about that. Good. <laughs> this is Wednesday night class. If it makes you go to the Bible, uh, that's, that's all I'm trying to do. And boy, I tell you what, I'm, I'm working on this book, you know, and as I'm writing, I can actually see people that I know. It's almost like they look leaning over my shoulder. Well, I declare, you know, I'm thinking, I, boy, I hope this, hope this helps a lot of people. I wish somebody would have given me the kind of book that I'm writing back when I was a little boy before I got saved. So wrong turn. Let's look to, at the U-turn. I told you we're going to split that two, two ways. First, U-turn, the letter U, where you do a 180. Um, I did that when I was up in the north of Ohio, I made a couple of wrong turns. <laughs> and and uh, rather than keep on trucking, you know, I had enough sense to stop, you know, and then do a 180 and go back to the right exit. So it didn't, didn't do too bad. It took still four hours, but it could have been worse. Uh, that's, we're going to look at the U-turn first. 
Now, that's why we're taking this brief portion of Scripture and cutting it up. Brothers, if anyone among you, not of you, has been led astray from the truth, and it's likely it's happened, here it is, and anyone turn him around. What's anyone mean? Anyone. How cool is that? And anyone turn him around. doesn't say, and the bishop, the elder, the pastor, whichever word you want to use, same office, or in James' case, also call him apostle. What should I call you, pastor? Anything but late for dinner. Joe is just fine. Joe is just fine. And anyone turn him around. Now, this is kind of interesting. Once again, the grammar here, here is third-class conditional sentence, and it's likely. I don't know about you, but I like that. That means you can do it. It's likely you can do it. It's likely that I can do it. You take the person that has been led astray. We're going to Jerry's and then go to Frisch's. You take the person that has been led astray by someone else, and according to James, even though it's likely that can happen in a local church, it's also quite likely somebody, anybody, can turn them around, can get them back on the right road. That means there's hope, there's room for everybody in the kingdom of God, even those that have been hoodwinked, deceived, and led in the wrong direction. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Now, once again, this is an unbeliever who has led this member wrong, and then what? A believer can lead him right. You think about some trips maybe you've taken by car. It's happened to me numerous times. Not too many, but numerous, enough that I remember. Somebody give me a uh, uh, well, actually, just within the last six months, I was supposed to see somebody in hospital and I uh, didn't know really how to get there quickly. And uh, I, I went to the wrong hospital. Same name, but it was the wrong hospital. So I drove around for a while. I pulled over to a, a, a truck stop type place. And a guy looked at me, could kind of see I was you know, perplexed and perturbed. He said, what you looking for? And I told him. I said, now there's two different ones. I said, I don't want this one. I'm looking for the other one. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. He told me exactly where to go. God is my witness. After going round and round on the interstate, I thought, this is finally starting to look familiar. Oh, and I saw the same truck stop that I had stopped at for directions 45 minutes ago. And the same hospital that I just left that was the wrong one. So, bless his heart, the guy gave me the wrong information. How many know it happens? Did, did you like it, Pastor? No. It should have been a 20-minute trip. It took me an hour and 20 minutes. When I got there to pray for the sick person, I want someone to pray for me. I was about half backslid, you know. How are things? Oh, it's just great, ma'am. How are you doing? I didn't like it. It's no fun, is it, being given wrong information when someone, especially when they're real bold about, this is the way it goes, go down here, second left, blah, 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 blah. Wow. But the good news is we don't have to leave the person who's been led astray on the wrong road. We can intervene and get him or her on the right road. In other words, we can be a bridge to Christ rather than a barrier. We can be a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block. It's our choice. How cool is that? We get to choose. And what's it mean to turn him around? Well, it, it actually means grab by the shirt and, <laughs> and shake it. No. It, <laughs> no. Epistrephe means, means literally to turn a 180, you know? It's, it's turning a 180. Um, and it's a beautiful word. Um, actually, Jesus used it in Luke 22, verse 32. I'm sorry, 23, verse 30. 22. Yeah, 22, 32. Uh, the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you, plural, all the disciples, but I have, that he may sift you, plural, as wheat, but I have prayed for you, singular, Peter, that your faith fail not. And when you are, if you've got a King James, when you are converted, it sounds like an old car, doesn't it? Going into the machine shop, coming out, goes into Ford, comes out of Caddy. You know? No, it, it actually means it's not something that's going to happen to you. When you have turned back, when you have turned back, how many know P Peter made a wrong turn? Deny that he knew Christ three times. Once would be bad enough. Three times. 
What's worse about that is he had first said, I will absolutely not leave you in the lurch. Strong language, double negative. I will absolutely not, Lord, let that happen to you. Guess what? It's used of him turning back. And then Peter used the same word in Acts 3 when he was preaching to a second crowd of unbelieving Jewish brethren. He said, repent, change your mind about Jesus. And King James says, be converted. Once again, it seems like something's happening to you. You know, God puts you in the machine and converts you. It's actually, and turn yourselves back. The idea is God's here, you're here. Change your mind about Jesus and turn yourself back to God. What will happen? You'll find out your sins have all been blotted out. And then you can experience seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So there it is. Um, uh, to me, this is tremendous. This is tremendous. Um, but in, in this, it's, it's the believer who is doing the turning. I find that interesting. The unbeliever leads the church member astray, but it's the believer that actually turns the church member back to the truth. Uh, how do you do that? We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. The important thing is to see that, that we can do it. Amen? We're basically doing the situation in reverse. The unbelieving troublemaker gets a hold of a church member, leads him down the wrong path. The believer finds out about it. Hey, what happened to Sister Hoopinetti? Remember, she used to be here every Sunday morning, every Wednesday. Boy, she'd been gone about three months. Someone says, oh, she's at that church a mile down the street, you know, the one that's got all the rainbows all over it, you know, and some kind of crazy doctrine. Oh, wow. So someone, Andy, decides to, to, to do something about it. Would you agree some people are gifted with one-on-one? -on -one? We can all do it. But someone from the congregation says, oh, wow, really? And I thought she had it together. And that person will go after that erring brother. They've been led astray. They've been on the wrong. It's literally road. Oh, those, the wrong road. And bring them back. Turn them back. It's an awesome ministry, isn't it? And as I've mentioned, um, we are talking not about a saint sinning by getting involved in false doctrine. We're talking about a church member in our midst, in, but not ek, of our midst, not a true believer. We're talking about the person in 1 Corinthians 5, called leaven and called uh, the wicked one. How many remember Matthew 18, 18? If whatsoever you bind on the earth shall have been bound in heaven, whatsoever you, yeah. Did you ever read the background of that? It's really helpful. Jesus gave that authority first to Peter, and he's the first one that used it on the day of Pentecost. And then two chapters later, he enlarged it, gave that same authority to every believer. What's it mean? What's it mean? Oh, shoot, fire, pastor. That means I can just buy whatever I don't want, loose whatever I do want. Too much rain? Wouldn't it be neat if some of our super faith people would have got down to Texas and stopped this catastrophe? Just bind it. It's right in there, isn't it? Whatever I bind is bound. I speak the word, heaven backs me up, right? I loose it, bless God, it stays loosed. Well, I'm still bound. Well, you never had me loose you, brother. The offering basket's right there. The more the offering, the bigger the loose. Come on. <laughs> and I just heard another, somebody else the other day, I was telling Ann Harris the other day, say one thing about it, you can't really figure out what to believe by studying the scripture. We need to... We need to put the lexicons aside. Let's forget about, by all means, let's please forget about that Greek. Don't bring that in. And let's look at the church fathers. Let them weigh in on this stuff. We can at least trust them. Really? Um, the, the word is a, a funny, funny way of cutting through all this. If you look at the context of Matthew 18, 18, a few verses earlier, it's talking about forgiveness of sin. That's all in the world it means, to bind and loose. It means to forgive someone's sins or to say your sins are retained. Jesus said that one more time in John's Gospel, chapter 20, the evening of the resurrection. He appeared out of nowhere and said, peace. It really it means peace to you. He inflated them. He breathed into them and said, receive here and now the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive, they stand forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they stand retained. 
It's all about forgiveness of sin. Matthew 18, verse 15 and following, it actually says, If your brother sins against you, go to him. If he repents, you've gained your brother. If he doesn't, take with you two or three others, so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything can be confirmed. If he doesn't listen to them, take it to the big shot, right? The bishop, the pet. No, take it to the church, the church members, the local church. Not a word is said about the big shot, whoever that is. Take it to the church. If he fails to listen to the church, then what? Let him be like a heathen or a tax collector. Now, why would we treat a brother or sister, a born-again child of God, a saint, why would we treat that person like an unbeliever or a, a public and a tax gatherer? Because that's exactly what they are. Jesus said of teachers, by their fruits you will. James said, of believers, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Proof of the pudding's in the eating, amen? amen? Once again, like 1 Corinthians 5, Matthew 18, 15 through 20 is talking about a church member, not a true believer. A true believer is not going to refuse to be reconciled three times. Once, let alone three times. But a professor church member? Why not? They, they've got, they, their heart's never been changed. Now, here we go. Here we go. Let him be knowing. This is the second you. God allows the U-turn, the 180. A believer is involved in getting this church member back on the right road. And that's where the Y-O-U of the U-turn comes in. Let him, whom, the one that did the one-on-one -on -one ministry, the one that went out after Sister Hupanani, after she left the church and got involved in false doctrine, went out and talked to her, reasoned with her, shared the scripture with her. Let him, the one that did that, be knowing that the one having turned back a sinner from the error of his way, turned back is that same concept, doing a 180, and the word error there, it's the noun of the same word we looked at. Planes is the noun of planao, to go, uh, the, the error, the, the mistake of his road or way. Um, how many were told recently in Texas, evacuate? How many were given the truth? How many of you know some people didn't listen? And what happened? Yeah, they're, they're suffering the consequences. It's the same thing spiritually. You and I, as members of a local church, if we've never really given our heart to God, we're open to all kinds of deception. We're open to being deceived and taken away from the truth. And what happens then? Well, hopefully in a perfect world, someone, some true believer in that same local church that we were in, but not necessarily of, will go find us and give us an opportunity to get off that wrong road, on the right road, and really give our hearts to God. Amen? So we won't have to pay the price. And what's the, what's the result of, I'm going to call it kind of an unusual one-on-one -on -one ministry because a lot of people just don't care. They just don't care. That person, let him be knowing that the one having turned back a sinner, again, that's not a saint, a sinner from the error of his way, shall save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. Wow. I think I used to preach it like this years ago, and, and you know, it's not necessarily wrong, there's a truth there. You could say, well, you know, maybe that's something like somebody's a diabetic, but they won't change their diet. You ever heard of that? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to make lifestyle changes. And someone says, hey, come on, stop eating that stuff and eat more protein. That'd be like, you'd save that person's life from death. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and, you know, there's an application there. But I think when, when we have the word sin, it's more than likely a moral thing. So we're not talking necessarily about keeping them from physical death, although if, if they make the wrong life choices and we lead them back to the right road, that could, that could certainly fit. 
But I think here in context, it's talking about spiritual things. It talks about sin, not a life choice, about what you eat or whatever, how much sleep you get. But this is talking about sin, moral things. You save that soul, I mean, that's the word for life, from death, which would mean spiritual death, and cover a multitude of sins. And I think that's so beautiful. The word cover there is, how many have heard of the apocalypse? The apocalypse. What that, what that is, is the word for cover with uh, apo in front of it, which, was, which would mean away. So you take away the covering. You unveil. You know, like if I had a, a beautiful picture here with a cover over it, and I pull the cover back so you can see the painting, that's the apocalypse, you know? And this is that word without the apo. So rather than putting the painting on display, the person that leads the church member out of error back to the truth has not put that person's wrongdoing and sin and moral failures and deceptions on, on a display for the whole world, especially the local church. Oh, wait till you hear what Sister Hoopendiddle was doing at that other joint. Oh, man. Wait till you hear what, what their services are like. Oh, you couldn't believe what she got into. No, actually just the opposite. Put the cover over it. Save her, his soul from eternal death by getting in one, involved in one-on-one -on -one ministry and getting them to turn around and cover those things. Love covers a multitude of sins, Peter says later. Isn't that nice? How many would like your wrongdoing just blazed abroad, big trumpet, you know? <laughs> Probably not, right? You can just imagine how embarrassing that would be. Um, if you need a little help living right, by the way, Dr. Peel used to say, if, you, if you're ever concerned about whether something's on the edge or not, just imagine reading about that with uh, headlines <laughs> in the paper with your name there. So-and-so was seen doing such a, would you like that? You know, that's, I'm just throwing that out there free of charge. Um, so, you know, as we, as we come in for a landing here, um, sins, spiritual salvation, very likely, of a church member, uh, but not a believer. How can we do it? Let me just give you two scriptures. The first thing we do is pray. 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, verses 24 through 26. You mind if I read those to you? Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is actually advice to a pastor, but I think you'll see the application is to any believer. So this is talking about a servant of the Lord in the local church and one or two uh, people are, are trying to split the church six ways from Sunday and uh, accusing different ones of different things, trying to stir up trouble. What should the minister do? Verse, this is 2 Timothy 2, 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. In other words, you don't get in that person's face. Um, you don't fist fight or whatever. Um, all ministers don't fist fight, do they? Yeah, they do. They do. Great big media ministry had their own local church in another state, and I talked to a minister that had been there for services, and he went to a Sunday night service, and he watched two different ministers that were on staff at that TV ministry's church talk about who was preaching that night as they were all going into the service, and they got into a fist fight going to church over who was going to preach. Paul says, don't do that. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, able to teach, patient, watch this, in meekness, instructing those that are opposing themselves. If God will give them repentance to the full acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him, the devil, to do his will. So you can pray that God will give them the gift of a change of mind, and then also you can use words from God's word showing the truth compared to the error they've gotten involved in. Um, and then what else do we do? Then I think we use the keys that Matthew talks about, chapter 18. Let's say that this erring member of the church listens, 
comes back, really gives their heart and soul to Jesus, but maybe is still a little troubled by guilt because of what they said, what they did, the money they'd wasted, the advertising they gave to the cult or whatever. You can say as God's man, God's woman, your sins are forgiven. I do that a lot in my campaigns when I'm overseas, and that's been a long time now. But after I lead somebody in an altar call, I will tell them, if you prayed that prayer from your heart and meant it and made Jesus Lord of your life, on the authority of God's words, your sins are forgiven. And they just go wild. Well, who wouldn't? You know, that's what it's all about. Not my subject tonight, but I just want to again remember, mention John 20, which I referenced, Matthew 18, Matthew 16. All those verbs, whatsoever you shall bind on the earth shall be having been bound in heaven. So it's not that we bind here and then heaven backs us up. It's exactly the opposite. Whatever you loose on the earth shall be having been loosed in heaven. How many follow what I'm saying? Very important. So we don't go down to Texas and bind the rain unless God has already done that. We don't loose something unless God has already loosed it. We just bind what he's bound. We just loose what he's loosed. And again, primarily, don't take my word for it. Read it. Matthew 16, Matthew 18, John 20. It's primarily the forgiveness of sins. Telling someone who repents and makes Jesus Lord, your sins stand forgiven. Telling someone who adamantly refuses to get off the wrong road, I've done all I can. And Jesus actually said you can preach without saying anything. Paul and Silas did that. Or Barnabas, I guess it was, in the book of Acts. Since you, it was necessary in the nature of the case for the gospel to be preached to you first, but since you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're going to the Gentiles. And they shook the dust off their feet. What are they saying? Your sins stand retained. Why? Because God said there's only one way to have sins forgiven, and that's to embrace Jesus. How cool is that? And again, the beautiful thing, this is available to every believer. It's a really nice ministry, and I, I submit to you, we might be needing this more and more in these last days when so many people are vying for Christians. They want them in the pew. They want their money in their coffer. They want their support, you know? And not all the people looking for that are the real deal. So we have to be wise. Any questions tonight or discussion on this? Has this helped anybody? Interesting? Practical, I hope?